morning and um, should we say happy Easter again? <laughs> well, what? What's funny? Oh goodness! <laughs> you, know, you had to, you had to come from heaven, you know, to, with you know. the light. Yes. I, I love that. Yes, oh, amazing, Tony. Good, Good morning and welcome, I'm Ayo Makinde. Well, this is one of those perfect days. You could say, rise and shine. You know, okay. hey, welcome to Sunrise Daily. We're coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. This Easter Monday, I'm Kaede Okikuli. It's easier to rise and shine, especially when you are not going to work. For so many people, I was today. driving on the road and everyone was empty. <laughs> you know, the, way, the way the tomb was empty, the road was empty. <laughs> and I, you know, there was this feeling inside of me. I felt like going to everyone's house to wake them up, saying, "Let us work." <laughs> But it's all good. It's a public holiday here in Nigeria, so yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, you know, be, being public holiday, uh, people don't get this opportunity every time. Mm. And you know, with all of the issues happening, occasionally an opportunity to take a break to to sift through the issues is always you know welcome for those who don't have to go to work, and for those who run shifts as well. I mean, you you may have those days where you don't have to go. To, to work and all of that. But for those who are home today, whose normal nine to five is on pause simply because it's a public holiday, kudos to you. Maybe there are things that you want to learn from it. Someone had told us this morning that we needed to go to Galilee. I don't know if... Uh... Here we are, <laughs> reporting to you live from the Lagos version of Galilee. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just excited, really. It, it's been weeks, and I must be honest, I think we've had this conversation. It's been weeks of having to sift through the news, you know, looking for something cheery here and there across the, the news. But, I mean, we look at the stories, insecurity, a lot of it, actually, a lot of lives lost. Needlessly, I must say, we look at the economy. Different issues. ASU strike is still right there, staring us in the face. Lots of students are at home. But, you know, this season is that season where you have hope. You know, I mean, going by the account of the Bible, the death of Jesus, it was like all hope was lost. I mean, death signifies the end for a lot of people. But in this case, death actually signified the beginning of greater things. And, and, and I think that's actually uh, something that is making me joyful this morning. The fact that, yes, things are going bad. They said that religion is the opium for the masses and, and all of that. But there's always that little spark of hope that can be ignited into a big fire. So yes, things aren't looking good. We must be honest with ourselves. Things aren't exactly looking good, but there is hope. This is not the end for this nation. We can rise from this and become truly what we deserve to be, the greatest nation on earth. Especially when you also recount one of the things that this whole Galilee thing, this Easter Monday is supposed to depict, mm -hmm. supposed to depict the day where he actually, you know, rose to heaven, so to speak, where he said, meet me at also place, and you're going to see me, you know, transit to heaven with a promise. You say hopes, hopes of a promise that will be fulfilled. And so uh, today, uh, irrespective of all of the things that are in the news, and you, you talked about some of those issues, don't also forget that we are having uh, issues around uh, health service providers all over the nation, uh, children who are supposed to go into university, those who are in university on pause, so many things almost unsure right now. And guess what? At the end of it all, we are still preparing for the 2023 elections. And, uh, you know, government is talking about the census coming up um, in, next year. So many other issues. But occasionally spare a moment or two to pray pray for your nation and be confident that so long as you believe because you see it's one thing to 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 be religious as we discussed last week it's another thing to have faith altogether so it just express a little bit of hope and confidence and faith in this country don't forget coat of arms unity and faith peace and progress unity and faith a little bit of that in the country and you can be sure that we have everything it takes to be everything we want to be. Let's not waste too much time on that this morning because you have some thinking to do. While you're doing that, how about we take a look at the papers this morning?
Let's begin with the Guardian newspaper this morning, and uh, this is what it says. You know, we were talking about you know education earlier. Yep. Southwest businesses, ivory towers sink under endemic power failure. I don't even know, you know what to make of that, but that's what you have on the front page of the paper this morning. Find the details on the inside pages. For Ondo LG is not on national grid for 10 years. And we know, anyway, more of the writers. Afeba Balala University opts out of Benin Disco Network. Mm. Mm. Ikiti academic institutions exploring alternative power sources. Buhari's aide Zakari describes grid collapse as sabotage. All of that packed on the front page of the paper continues on page two of the Guardian newspaper this morning. You know, you know I, I had a reason to be with a friend recently, I think it was last weekend, and he said that in this city, that they also completely opted out of public power supply. Mm. So what they're doing? Generators. It's a, it's a religious organization. Okay, so it's so just on generators. On generators. Not even solar or... Uh -uh. Only generators. They don't say that they, they have had to endure uh, estimated billings. Oh, right. And they are just tired. I, you know what shocks me? The fact that people actually want to pay for power, which is why they seek alternative means, this time generators, some go for solar, yeah. renewable energy and all of that. So people have at least the capacity, they want to pay for power and they say willing buyer, willing supplier Same. or whatever that agreement is. So isn't there a way to find a meeting point? Because indeed, people know they have need for this power and they'd rather actually rely on power coming from the grid because there's no noise anyway. Absolutely. You don't have to endure either diesel or petrol generating sets noise so I, I still find it quite mind-boggling that we're not been able to you know marry that so. it's a it's a it's a big issue because one of the things that we heard yesterday was say that the uh, discos were rejecting supply I, I I'm well I'm not we the consumers sector. don't want to reject <laughs> Please think. I'm still finding it difficult to understand the most you do is switch off uh, your power, your, your TV and I all mean, that, if you don't want to consume yeah, too much. You know, but. but that's what you have on the lead of the paper this morning. Um, what all of that means and how it can come to anything you find on the front page continues on the inside pages. Of course, that picture is of a concert that held, uh, he holds every year for Easter. I find that one in the papers. And right under the nameplate, you have destroyed Nigeria, divided citizens, enthroned corruption. Kuka hates Buhari again. That story is on page two of the paper this morning and a number of other issues you will certainly find interesting. That's the Guardian newspaper this morning. Well, it's from there that the Nigerian Tribune picks it up this morning, this Easter Monday morning. By the way, the Nigerian Tribune is wishing you happy Easter just on that left top mm -hmm. corner. But the big story, Kuka to Buhari, Nigerians no longer recognize their country. Northern bishops back northern elders on call for Buhari's resignation. Nigeria's peace, prosperity will be restored soon. That's coming from Vice President Oshimbajo. But Abiyamila, governors, others call for prayers at Easter. Pages two and four of the paper this morning. And just on top of the nameplate, you see that build up still ongoing war without end between Tinubu or Shimbajo supporters. Election no be war. Is that, isn't that what they say? <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's let's just maybe they should add campaign. No, be war too. So <laughs> let's just assume that the war is used uh, loosely and of not in a strict strict sense. Of course, because, because both election campaigning, everything shouldn't be war. No, be war. And you know that's also a little scary and maybe concerning mm. when you realize that election period usually comes with a lot of unrest yeah. and uh, violence and all of that. So this tone you know, maybe suggesting something for security agencies to give a little more attention to so that it doesn't spill into what we don't want it to spill into. So this is intelligence right on the front page of the papers. Absolutely. Yeah? And I think Absolutely. it's also important for these leaders, every chance they get, to put the word out there, speak with their supporters. Absolutely. And I mean, their supporters in the inner circle, they're those in, it's like a donut in a donut in another donut. Um, donut. <laughs>
I'm just trying to use that. You know, they're different circles. You say moi moi with. Uh, well, there are no holes in moi moi anyway. So oh, oh, I'm just trying to say a circle, circle. <laughs> so it's important for those leaders to keep telling them, guys, except <laughs> openly come out and say, oh, I'm for violence. But if you're not, ensure you tell your people that there is no room for violence in the build up to this election. We've seen so much bloodshed in this country. Honestly. Well, on, on to the big picture, you see, MNJTF eliminates 100 terrorists in Lake Chad. I mean, this is the kind of story we like to see. And let me just take this one for you, because it's Easter, right? A lot of people need food, gas, and all that to have a good celebration. Well, surging food and gas prices push Nigeria's inflation rates to 15.92%. That's out there. A lot of people feel this already. But the question is, what are we doing to ensure that this is brought under control? That's the Nigerian tribute for you. But to spill that also to the front page of the Daily Times newspaper this morning, same as the lead of the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, there on perspective, Kuka to Buhari, you've destroyed Nigeria, divided citizens, says President's government in hibernation mode. Um, um, you know, I'm just going to leave it there because I don't know what that means. Uh, hibernation is, is government, governance on pause. Well, maybe that's, I don't know. But because we still have state governments, right? Right above the nameplate, Zamfara. Ex-Governor Yari, Senator Marafa, dump APC, join PDP. <laughs> oh, some people didn't see that coming. Some are still shocked. <laughs> but it's politics. It's quarter to 2023. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what some people say, um, both leading parties mm. are pretty much the same. Because you can just... Hey, cross carpet without... You know those areas uh, that the border of a country where it's just a little line. You step a little bit, you're in one country. You step back, you're in Nigeria. You know, you can do that. It's like, that's what's happening here. Are you, in, in, by any chance, inferring if you're a Mudakeke? Yeah. I'm just I said saying. country. Oh, country. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to be I sure. didn't step. I'm not stepping into that landmine this morning. <laughs> Well, uh, that's the, the Daily Times newspaper also has this one. Serap asks Buhari to withdraw pardon for Darye Inyame. Find that story on page two. And right beside that one, Wike has no moral justification to criticize pardon granted to Inyame Darye. That's according to Garbashe, who found the details of that on page five of the Daily Times newspaper this morning. Well, the Daily Trust is focusing on APC primaries. Uh, I mean, there are reports that this is meant to take place at the end of next month. Of course, uh, next meeting is meant to ret ra ratify that. I was told it was rectify and ratify. <laughs> rectify. But the word is ratify. There you go. So, APC primaries, Tinubu, Oshimbajo, Amechi, others scramble for 7,800 delegates. Odds favor ex Lagos governor, running mate Ashiwaju's obstacle. VP Minister Bang on Buhari's expected endorsement. A party to release timetable and mode of primaries Wednesday. That's two days from now. But what's even more interesting is the way the Daily Trust breaks down the delegates across geopolitical zones. So you have the Northwest, according to the graphics you see there, with 1,924 delegates, the Northeast with 1,212, North Central with 1,278. FCC with 53, of course, Southwest 1568, South South 927, and the Southeast 838. So, total 7,800 delegates. And, and there's uh, a breakdown of the states, too. According to state. So, uh, just how relevant is this in the light of the polit politicking? Well, I guess more details you find on page four of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. And there are those who are speculating, wait a minute. Is consensus going to be an option for the APC as well this time around? Uh, it's I think really dicey because the big guns, they, 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 those guns are big. I, I think it's just fair <laughs> to leave it open. Mm. Even for the, um, for the elective positions within the party, mm. it was a tricky one, really, to even get consensus. So imagine for, I don't know, you don't you can't call them these are big wigs or big fish but at least for a bigger uh, stage consensus might be difficult but hey 
You never know. <laughs> You're not in the political party, so you really don't know. Exactly. So <laughs> we'll just wait to find out how they go ahead with this one. So that's the lead on the front page of the Daily Trust APC primaries. But under that infographic, so on the front page of the Daily Trust, you see this one. Seven years after, aviation agencies yet to get boards. And this is something we hear a lot. This one yet to get a board, board yet to be constituted and all of that. I wonder uh, how this affects the operations of you know those different do i say agencies and all of that so there you have it right there seven years after aviation agencies yet to get bored of course the story about uh, security troops killed top 10 iswap commanders a hundred others in lake chad is also there and um let's just leave it there for the daily trust the leadership newspaper uh, on its front page is also talking 2023 Asso Rock stays aloof as aspirants battle for APC tickets. That story is on page four. Intensify consultation, lobbying for presidential endorsement. Amechi visits Adamo in Nasarawa. I'm not stepping down for anyone, says Umahi. Show Nigerians your legacies, Kuka tells his parents. Find the details on the front page well the details on page four of the paper this morning and, you know i don't know that those there are those who are wondering how significant really is that presidential endorsement because there are those who say look the size of the president's vote is no bigger than that of uh, of uh, wine <laughs> I mean, it's one man, one vote, right? One man, one vote. But that's when it comes to election day. In fact, on election day, things might sway. I mean, you can't, you can't whisk away or wish away rather the the influence of. I'm not, man, this is not a governor. This is not a senator. The president, the commander in chief of the armed forces. Yes, one man, one vote. But one president, uh, <laughs> it's going to do a lot. But you know, there's a good side and a bad side too. And I think that's what the president tried to reference in that interview we had with him about whether or not he had a favorite. Saying, "Well, if I say who my favorite is, <laughs> then that's literally the end for that person." So it comes with the good side and the bad side. The moment you become, or it is known that this is the president's favorite, is as though the president draws a target. On the person's back mm -hmm. so yes it, some people might fall in line naturally to curry the president's favor but some others will say oh you're the anointed child you're the joseph right the loved we're going to show you so i mean mixed one right there and it's really 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 delicate because the times are really very interesting yeah. well that's the story you'll find it the details of it on page four as we said right above the name plate easter Simba Joba Jabia Mela, others pray for peace. Oh, we most certainly want that. Stories on page six. Zulum raises salaries of doctors in liberated LGAs. Find that story on page 11. And that is cheering. One. And I think it's important to mention that story because it's always very tricky to have doctors go to those areas. Mm. I mean, this, these are areas that were taken over by terrorists and were, of course, recovered. So usually there's that reluctance to want to be posted there. In fact, some will be posted there and they'll reject, reject outright. So, I mean, have some sort of incentive financially, but also security-wise. Mm. Because yes, I mean, the money is good. It attracts them, especially now that a lot of people are even looking for greener pastures. Mm. So if this is a greener pasture, in quote, they will naturally go there. But also the security quotient should also be very tight. And it also underscores the importance of governors, the yeah. roles governors have, can play in incentivizing these this um, delicate responsibilities because exactly. if the if professionals can go to these areas development will be able to get to those areas Absolutely. quicker and all of that so it's a good one and we can only hope that it gets better right under the nameplate ease of doing business terminal operators risk sanctions over obstruction the details of that you'll find on uh, continue on page seven of the paper this morning well this story you know came in came to four last week but it's on the front page of the leadership newspaper Eleven thousand five hundred and thirty six schools closed over insecurity in nigeria that's according to unicef the story is on page nine now multiply eleven thousand five hundred and thirty six schools by an average of a hundred students oh we can bring it down for okay being fair. Let's, 50. Say, let's even be let's say 30. Okay, 30. I mean, just let's say that. 11,536 times 30. 
And it, it, each time I look at a story like this, it brings to mind what, the president, what former President Obasan just said, that if we do not do something about education, about out-of-school children, we are brewing terrorists for the future. Okay. And we need to give attention to these things. So that's on the front page, and we can only hope that it is catching the attention of the authorities. It's New Telegraph's moment now. On the front page, you have Nigeria broken under Buhari, Bishop Kuka Lamin. So we've seen this consistent across front pages this morning. Pages 2 and 8 says President has divided the country along ethnic religious lines, insists only corruption alive in Nigeria as well as other angles. But this one from Governor El Rufai saying darkness can't triumph over God's or plans of God. So pages 2 and 8. But take a look at this one under the big picture. Darye Yamez, pardon. Your criticism not justified. Presidency slams Wiki. Says Rivers Governor was absent at meeting where decision was taken. Adds Rivers Deputy Governor who joined virtually switched off her camera. So it's a page three read. Uh, you wonder where this is leading. But clearly the controversial question of the pardon is still out there. I mean, sometimes I, mean, I consider that story, it's funny. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was that person, that, that, that's pardon, that decision, was it discussed or announced? I wasn't at the meeting, so. Yeah, naturally, it should be voted on. Okay. And then an agreement should be made. And of course, the outcome should be put out, which has been already. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's, there's a process, right? There's the whole following the due process, but there's the substantive matter which a lot of people still question. So I'm sure this is going to continue to be, this is going to continue to be some sort of debate uh, in the coming days, uh, definitely. Uh, take a look at this one. Uh, Nigerian youths are not lazy, Tinubu. 2023, I carried Olu funding wife's ambition with Ondo money. That's according to PDP, seven and eight, pages seven and eight. I told you it's quarter to 2023, so you see a lot of these things. And just right next to that, this one will interest you. Nigerian masses will become Belo's godfathers as president, Hafsat Belo. Sorry, Hafsat Abiola. <laughs> Nigerian masses will become Belo's godfathers as president. So, a host of other stories on the front page. CBN sells $14.62 billion in 11 months. That's also uh, one you might want to read. And that's it for the New Telegraph this Easter Monday. Bringing an end to a look at the papers this morning. We're back after now. Please stay with us. This is the fourth time President Muhammad Buhari is presiding over the Council of State meeting. The meeting has in attendance former presidents of Nigeria and top government officials like the Vice President, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, the Chief of Staff to the President, and the National Security Advisor. After four hours of deliberations, journalists are briefed on the resolutions reached by Council. First, despite the high levels of insecurity, especially in remote parts of the country, and activities leading to the 2023 elections reaching top gear, 
A national census is built to hold between March and April of 2023. Normally we give about uh, six months to eight months after uh, the pilot census before we conduct the main census. So that's why we're also conducting the main census after uh, the elections have taken place and the outcomes uh, are revealed. So that will be between March and April. There will also be a security summit on Tuesday, the 19th of April, 2023, to discuss the various security threats across the country. Where the situation is escalating, is mentioned. Where the situation is getting better, was mentioned. And uh, suggestion, like I've said, were prepared and solution discussed. And that was why President wants to call for the uh, Security Council meeting on Tuesday to discuss all the issues raised. So one of the questions that still hangs over this nation is that of just how many are we? Are we 160 million? Are we 200 million? Are we 206 million? Different figures have been thrown out there. All of them estimates. And this morning we're going to be tackling that big question. But this is not the first time really that we've tried to approach uh, this question of census in this country. We have tried pre-independence, but we'll focus on the ones we've done post-independence. And the earliest that's after independence was in 1962. That was the first time we attempted what is called census post-independence. Now, this was a very controversial one. I mean, we're just a young nation trying to keep count of how many we are, or we were at that time, but the results were not quite accepted on allegation of politicization. But at that point, the provisional result was that Nigeria was 45.1 million. Of course, that was thrown out. And a year after... <laughs> it's even interesting that that happened immediately. One year <laughs> after, you know. Um, critics claim it was by negotiation rather than enumeration. We'll find out the details of that. The reason for that, you know, in this conversation was the difference in negotiation and enumeration in enumeration <laughs> well they, at that that said we were 55.6 million at the time and fast forward to 10 years after we okay. tried to conduct another census in 1973 well, this one was not published on the ground of what they called deliberate falsification again the purported result was 79.8 million nigerians interestingly just about a year or so after an attempt was made to to conduct another one, mm -hmm. but was jettisoned for some reasons. Oh. Um, fast forward, okay, so how many years is this one? It's 20, almost 20 years after. F 14, oh, this is tricky, <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> almost, I mean, about 18, 18 years. years, actually. Okay, we conducted another one all over the country, largely scientific, unacceptable. Uh, we were 89 million in 1991, according to that result. And then finally, 2006, we conducted another census. This one, we tried to upgrade it. We used GPS, satellite imagery, machine readable forms were, were also deployed. And that's how we arrived at 140 million. Yeah, those who are still asking questions, well, are we really, what, was that even scientific? And then that contest started. Who is, where do we have more people? Is it Kano or Lagos? In fact, let's break it down for you. Uh, let's give you the top 10 from that one, just to set a background so we understand what we have on our hands this morning. It's a big, in fact, one of the biggest topics now in the country. So the 2006 census came up with this result. So we broke it down, top 10. Kano led with 9.4 million mm. according to that year's census and you know the rest is is, is just there but you know uh, for for those who are interested those are the figures that we have top 10 most populous states yeah. not cities states in the country as of 2006 and there are speculations now that lagos which came second on this list is about 20 some say 22 million now. So, not to worry. I mean, the figures can get you lost. But we have someone who is going to walk us through what the politics, the policies, and, of course, 
the implementation of all of these uh, ideas and suggestions. We're joined on the program right here in our Lagos studio by Mrs. Bimbola Salu Hondei, who is Honorable Federal Commissioner, National Population Commission. She was acting chairman of the National Population Commission between 2019 and 2020. Madam, it's good to have you on the program this Thank morning. Thank you very much. And happy Easter me. Monday. Same to you. It's great to drag it's you out a, on the Easter Monday. <laughs> no, it's always a pleasure to be on channels. Isn't it? Was, yeah. Aren't you supposed to be on holiday? We can't be on holidays. Oh, really? You just said it too. This is a very, very important national assignment. That's okay. And so all hands must be on deck. We want to make sure this time the figures are reliable, accurate, and verifiable. Because it, it's always a, a point of controversy. And we try to chronicle the build-up from 1960, mm -hmm. how it continues to be a controversy, even till today. So, but walk us, I mean, down memory lane. Why has it been difficult to conduct a census? Last time was 2006, 16 years after, when the UN actually prescribes that it should be done 10 years. In fact, it says five years to be more accurate. So why has it been difficult? Well, I'll be honest with us here because Nigeria belongs to all of us. In Nigeria, census has been largely politicized, like you said. I recall as acting chairman, when I appeared at the Senate once at the House to defend our budget, I did say to them that we would appreciate that census taken is also regularized in law, mm. just as elections. We all know that whatever happens, election takes place every four years. But we don't have that in Nigeria. The periodicity for census taking is yet to be fixed by the law. And that's why it's left to the whims and caprices of whoever is in government, which shouldn't be, because census, even though it affects a lot of political decisions, it is not a political activity. It is an economic activity. It is an activity that takes a nation to its next level. So it should never be politicized. And that's why, with due respect to every one of us and to everybody listening to me, Nigeria is where it is today. Is, is, is this is a foundation of development for any nation. And because we've missed it, that's why we are here, where we are today. This is, is, this, is this fact lost on the authorities who are supposed to, for want of a better word, champion the course of NPC? Well, the way I'll see it is, is it is also, I think it's a multifaceted thing. For example, in the Constitution, we, uh, the, the National Population Commission is the only government agency that is allowed to take the census, but the periodicity is not fixed in it. I recall when I as acting chairman again, and I had to attend the African Union meeting where I was made the chairman, Nigeria was made the chairman for population and development. The issue they kept on asking me was, why have you not fixed, why there is no fixed periodicity for your census taking? AU is also very interested because, you know, Nigeria is seen as a giant still, mm -hmm. and whatever we do affects other nations. And I did say to them that it is because of that lacuna in the Constitution. What we now need to do, and I'm happy I want to thank the current assembly, they're also looking into it now. They want to fix the periodicity. That's number one. Number two, why I've always felt that our census would always be subject to litigations, politics, and all that is, even though the National Population Commission is one of the agencies designed and designated by the Constitution to be independent, I do not think we are totally independent. Because if you go to other parts of the Constitution, it says that when we conduct a census, it must be subject to the approval of the Council of States. We are appointed by Mr. President. If what I do is subject to the Council of States, you, you understand what I'm saying? Is that, then the root, sorry, Kade, is that then the root of the politicization that you're talking about? I, I want to say it's part of it. I'm being honest because I want Nigeria to go. It, it the truth. Because if we're like INEC, when INEC, you conduct election, you can go to court. If the court says it wasn't proper, there is a re-election. There is no provision for a recount of the census. So even if the tribunal say, like in Lagos states the last time, a lot of states went to court and the tribunal agreed that some places were not properly counted. But no, the law does not have the power to order a recount. That's also not very good for us. If these things are put in order 
and people know that, okay, if you count me, I don't agree, and I'm certain we're not 10, we're just two, and you're calling us 10. If we go to court and the court says it's true, they're, ju they're just um, two, they are not 10, and you can do a recount. But we don't have that. The law is like in that area also just, it cannot bite. Mm. It can only back. So let's get into this. I, I mean, I'm glad you, you give us that... Um that retrospective view so that we can understand where we're coming from and understand how to approach this current one. So, I mean, the Council of State again has given an approval. Let's conduct census next year, have some pre, I don't know what it's called, pre-planning or piloting this year. But what is quite curious, madam, is the fact that census was meant to take place May this year. In fact, it was budgeted for 177 billion naira. The chairman of the MPC had spoken about this, said it, we're going to conduct census May 2022. What happened? Let me say this to you. When the national population, we've been shouting we want to conduct census. We've been working towards it. The chairman is right. And we thank Mr. President for making that money available. But in census, until Mr. President gives a proclamation, as the Council of State has done now, we cannot. They, mu they must give us a date. It's not like elections. Even though we know we're ripe for census, and Mr. President appreciates that, and Council of State, that's why they have now come up to say, okay, you want to do it in May. We also even thought we could do it in November. I can tell you that. But then, in their own wisdom, as you know, they have looked at everything, the elections are coming, maybe a lot of things, and they say, now you would have it in April. We're still very grateful, at least, because when there is a census, when there is a count of your people, it's not just numerical count. It's a count of the characteristics of everybody living in your nation. And that also helps you to protect the integrity of Nigerians. Because then you know who is a Nigerian, then you know what we do, what we need, when... The, it amuses me. Every year we produce budgets, states produce budgets, ministries produce, on what is the, on what basis? Mm. It should be from the data, because the census is the mother of all data. It should be from the data produced originally by the census, then others take from there. Is there a way um, to insulate this exercise from the vagaries of politics as, you know, it had been subjected to, so to speak, in previous counts. I want to say technology is the best way. And now, like you did say, this time we've improved on our technology. We've got the, we've carried out enumeration area demarcation in about 98% of Nigeria, even in some parts of Borno State. About how many percent, sorry? 98 Oh, interesting. Yes. We just have about two or three local governments remaining. So you're really ripe for this thing. If they we say conduct ripe. this next month, you're able to do that. It can't be next month, let's be honest. I'm just <laughs> saying, just, just to put this in proper context. No, because you see, census is a process of processes. You have to have a lot of... No, we have done the pretests, first and second pretests. We have to do the trial census. There are a lot of things you must do before you get to the actual and the main census. That's why it's described as the mother of all data. Because in census, every data that you can think of is put in it. That's why we have over 70 something questions that we ask. And now we're using technology. We have the PDA. We've already carried out our enumeration area demarcation quiz uh, satellite imagery and then the GPS tells you it's not like before where you just keep going to street to street. The GPS tells you where you are. We can check if you actually got there and then we'll ask you how many households have been here. Channels has been wonderful being a voice for us on that. We've spoken to people. We've asked the numbers of households. This time we'll have the trial census which is like you know what a trial is. It's like yeah. a mood census. That's what we're planning to do. So walk us through the process. I mean, we understand how voting takes place. We've had to, we do this for years. A lot of us should get maybe a certificate of voting because we've gone through it, we know it. But for census, it's quite tricky. Some people are new to this. I mean, 2006, someone born then will be 16 years this year. So clearly a lot of people don't understand. What is the process this time around? What, you said 70 something questions will be asked each yes. household. So would you just say how many are you in your family? They tell you 50, no. 
you put 50 down, how many wives, I have 24. Is, is that how it's going to work this time? No, census have, doesn't work like that. And that's why we had to do the architectural foundation. We laid the architectural foundation. The enumeration area demarcation is actually the architectural foundation. With that, we have divided the whole country into smaller, smaller units that can be captured by just two a pair of enumerators within that specific period. Recall that for every census in Nigeria, there's usually a holiday of about seven days because you must all be where you are, yeah. you know, so that we can count you. Because what the census does is to tell you how many people live in channels, how many live in the estates, so that we know how many we want to give cameras to, how many we want to give seats to. So we must meet you where you actually live. I'll come to another painful aspect, why census is almost not very accurate in Nigeria. And that is the census migration culture that we have, especially in Lagos State. And it hurts, because Lagos State is burdened with a lot of pressures, traffic, jam, electricity, water, roads, everything. But when it's time for census, because Nigerians believe that the more we are in my village, the more allocation we get from the federal government. So they move from, from Lagos, we are their children's school, they work in the banks, their wives work here, they live here, their grandparents, everybody, they move back to their states. This is very wrong. I think it should be criminalized. So people should not move pre census. They shouldn't census. move. It should be, census migration should be criminalized it, if we must get our developmental policies right in Nigeria. Isn't that to say that the, the, the quantum of information or education about it is, is not as much as it ought to be? I remember, I think we, we, we shared this you yes. know, you know, song that some musicians actually <laughs> produced a song to educate people about the census. I don't hear such noise these days. And I'm pretty sure there is a number of people watching us right now who are wondering, really, you mean you've covered 98% of local governments in Nigeria and I'm just hearing about it now? So perhaps there is the need for that communication to go round. As people migrate for census, so do some migrate for elections. So is there a way, how, how was the level of, what, what's the level of education, not just inform, informing people, what's the level of education been like? What kind of challenges have you had, what kind of pushback, what kind of information have you sifted from people in the process of getting this done? You're accurate, you're really correct. Uh, the Nigerians are yet to truly understand what we do. You know, it even amuses me when people hear National Population Commission, they even say it's only census we do. We don't. We talk about the vital statistics of the nation, the age, the school, the birth rate. We start from entry to exit. When a child is born, we register the child. When the child marries, we register marriages. When the child migrates from one state to the other, or he leaves Nigeria, or he comes in, we register. And then when the person dies, from entry to exit. But these things are not known. But I can assure you that the National Population Commission this time, the chairman has promised that we would really have a robust media coverage to educate people like you said and that's why we're grateful to channels as always because you are a huge voice we need you more at this time to help us make nigerians understand the importance of census because as you have observed when people understand the importance they then tend to be less political about it they know it's for their comfort it's not for allocation at the, head, uh, the, national, uh, uh, the national government, it is for their own comfort, it's for every local government to be able to plan. Because if in my local government, for example, I'm from Ali Mosho, if my chairman says, if I, if I, National Population Commission, tells my chairman that 10 children were born in the year 2020, mm -hmm. and then he tells me in his budget he wants to provide 400 schools, and I know he's lying, isn't it? That there's going to be a bit of corruption. Census data will check corruption. Census data aids developmental, um, the development of any country because we give data that helps them to formulate policies right. that would lead to better development of the people. What, what happens in the situation where, okay, let's paint a scenario. So, um, I live in Lagos, and I'm going to have seven free days, seven-day holiday, so to speak, um, for the census. Let me steal this time to go visit my people in the village. I get counted there. Meanwhile, you have come to my place in Lagos, and um, you have been told that there are 10 people living in that house. I was at work. 
when you came. They, when you now come for the proper census in April 2023, I will be in my village. I will not be at home, so I will not be counted. Take us through that. My, my colleague was asking you about the process. So in the event that such a thing happens, what are the implications? The implications are really bad, and that's the truth. That's why we're saying that census migration should be criminalized. If during the enumeration area demarcation, which we had started since 2015, and we've just done an update in a few weeks ago, and we've been to your house, and you've told us there are 10 households, and then I come back and I only meet two households, and we note that, that's during, because in census, we we'll speak to everybody. In enumeration area demarcation, we talk about household. It's in is a catering arrangement. I did say that here. Yeah. How many of you eat from the same pot? That's what we do. So that's how we decide, okay, once we get to a threshold, we say this one enumeration area, we move on to another one. So in a local government, you can have 1,000 enumeration areas, and they will begin to post enumerators there during census, mm -hmm. a pair of enumerators. You go here, you go here, you go here. So if we are we're supposed to get 1,000 households, we meet 200 households. We record each person in the house or during census. Everybody is spoken to. If a child is born on that census day, we also record that child. You we, have to see the person. We must see you during census. During enumeration, we don't have to see you because that is by sampling. It's just an aggregate we're looking for because that's a disaggregated data. Enumeration is a disaggregated data. Now, during census, we want to see everybody. And when we want to see everybody, you've gone to your village because it's a holiday. And then the enumeration chart is tampered with. And census is a real chart that the government must work with because it's the mother of all data. And we give that to your government, and the government says, no, there are only two people living here, so they only need two roads, isn't it? But you've gone to your village, and your village thinks there are 10 people living there, and your governor is trying to build 10 roads when actually he only needs to do two roads. Corruption on that side, corruption on this side. You are shouting it's not enough here. He has more than enough there. And then planning becomes upside down. Isn't, isn't that why it might be good to work with states on this one? I know some governors have, have tried to conduct this. Yes, it's, it's not constitutional, but isn't it important to have some sort of handshake with governors? Because after your own process, the people will come back and states have their data as well. We'll get to that. But do you look to some sort of collaboration with states. We do, we do. We, the, our first visit, the chairman's first visit, the chairman of the commission, his first, his first visit, and I was in the entourage, was to the, um, the DG of governors, um, His Excellency Fayemi. Nigeria Governors uh, Forum. Yes, a Nigeria Governors Forum. Um, his Excellency. Governor Fayemi. Governor Fayemi, we went. And recently we've been visiting elder statesmen, past heads of states, and all that. We would actually visit every governor. We intend to talk to them, we intend to talk to the Nigerian Governors Forum mm -hmm. to educate them also, to plead with them also, that they let their people know that it's better for them to stay in their places, even for their own integrity, because they can plan better and whatever they do can be seen better. Because if you ask them to come in and people say, You told us you would do this and you're not doing it, just because your data is inaccurate, you cannot plan properly well. <sighs> A lot of stops we have on this conversation yes. because it's very important. Yes. We, we definitely will not exhaust it. But help us understand this. So we have different ways we gather data. All right. So we have the current NIN. We have BVN, bank verification number. We have uh, the one you get from the social investment program. I think they have a database already. Driver license. F FRSC driver's license, you have um, INEC, of course. INEC has its database as well. And it can go on and on. States have their own. Also, Lagos, other states, they have, you know, database. So, really, can't we harmonize these data? Save through the ones, and of course, you see double registration, definitely, there will always be overlaps. Save through and come up with our figure as the census of Nigeria. That's very true. It can be harmonized. And the best way to harmonize is to first of all go through the mother of all data. And that's the census. But, but we have these data scattered, Those questions are also asked during census. If you have an NIN, it is stated. That is harmonization. We're doing that as well. And you would recall, I did say here, that INEC told us then they were waiting for the result of our enumeration area demarcation so that they can know 
how to set up the polling units. It's also used. Everybody uses the census data. So clearly doing this after election is counterproductive because INEC will not, not be able to properly No, no, no. Plan. We've already done the enumeration area demarcation. INEC has that. So they just want to see where is more populated, where you have more households, where to put these polling units, where not to put polling units and all that. So that's why we had to finish it up. We finished last year, December, but we had to do an update of those we did not use the digital method mm -hmm. to conduct. That's how we had to do an update because we had started it since 2015. Then we're not fully digitalized, but now we are fully digitalized. So we had to go back to ensure that those ones comply with digitalization. But why is it hard, pardon me, but why is it hard to harmonize data in Nigeria, have a central pool? I mean, we have so much, INEC boasts of oh, close to 90 million now, the NIN, the BVN, the Social Investment you just Program, said it. The reason it is hard is because there is no accurate census. Census is the mother of all data. INEC data, this data, they're all children of the census. Once you have the foundation right, Everything will fall in place, but census has not been gotten right. Is that not the truth? We all know that. If this time, and we hopefully know we will by the grace of God, we get everybody counted in Nigeria and we know your demographic characteristics this time, you will be sure that name everybody, they will just flow on it. And this is how it is done. And that's why some countries would now take um, census, online census every five years. Because you can do that once your foundation is good. You already know. We will now do the birth registration. You just know that, okay, numbers of children born in so-so year, numbers that die, you take it out, migration, you net it off. It's so easy. Mm -hmm. Every other survey is based on the census. You know, there are those who, are, who, who have also asked, my colleague asked, you know, and you just referenced uh, that INEC also has used some of the data you have uh, gotten so far for this election, for this census. And there are those who are wondering, and you also said that you're going to be visiting the governors. We are in the process of elections. Isn't there a significant influence or impact of the election processes and procedures or preparations on this census? There will be, because Nigerians are more interested in elections than the census. This is the truth. We see elections as do or die. But census is a peaceful process. And that's why we need the governors to also help us talk to their people, to the local government chairman. I know that in Lagos State, the governor is really backing us up. He wants accurate figures. So he's talking to the local government chairman, and I discuss with them often. And I will want to believe that every colleague of mine in every other state, you're aware that we have a federal commissioner representing each state of the federation, including the federal capital territory. I am very certain that every other commissioner is doing the same thing. These are grassroots things that you probably will not see on the face. But the aspect I agree with you is our media has not been as it should be. We're not talking as we should. But you can be sure we're hitting the road from now. The chairman has assured us. Well, uh, a, a former chairman of um, MPC uh, had described all the censuses in this country from 1816 as a mess fabricated, cooked up and unreliable. In fact, he had insisted that the past national headcounts were deliberately conducted to favor a particular section of the country. This is something we hear time and again. I'd just like you to speak to that because the quotient of trust is important in this whole process. So what do you say to that? Well, he sincerely, the, all the censuses in the past have been bedeviled with arguments and non-acceptability. The 2006 census that we felt was acceptable, Lagos went to court, Adama went, a lot of states went. So his opinion is true to that extent. But the truth again is this. This time, like I said, we're making use of a lot of technology. Technology has come to aid us a lot. If you get somewhere with your GPS, if you don't get there, the GPS will show it, isn't it, that you were not in this village. The satellite imagery is clear. States can also, governors also have to be very interested, like you said, sir. They must come to and say, look, these are my local governments. These are my areas. Be sure they are counted. Local government chairmen, like in South Africa, I read up about them. In South Africa, it is the, represent, the legislators that go from door to door to talk about census because it's important to them.
But here, we don't have that. So we want the legislature the, the, to be interested. The local government chairman must be interested. The councillors must be interested. The market women must be interested. Everybody must be interested. Would you be... So that at the end of the day, if we all do it together, even if where there are mistakes, because we're all human, we can be easily corrected and come out with the best. All we want for Nigeria is to have a perfect, reliable, verifiable census. So quick issues. Would you be taking biometrics as well? That's a very important question. We're looking into it seriously. The commission has not decided. The civil, the, the technocrats are bringing up opinions on biometrics and the type of biometrics. You know, biometrics also has its own variants and all that. So the all commission that. is yet to fully decide on that. What the commission has decided on now that is that it's a digital census. And you know biometrics is also digital, but the level of biometric we will take, the commission is yet to decide on that. Because but I think, I'll come back here and let you know. Because the biometric component will be very vital to the trust. I absolutely agree with because you. Because we have it with INEC, we have it with other forms of gathering data. So if there's biometrics, people will say at least you can have double registration mm -hmm. with biometrics. And finally, how accessible is data, at least the ones you have so far for, for the MPC, how accessible is it? it is, is it? for people who want to use it? Well, a lot of organizations rely on our data, especially multilateral organizations. Where can we get it from, the average Nigerian? Well, the truth again is that's why we're building a new library now, an e-library. We're also aware that in that area, the average Nigerian is not even aware of a lot of our data. It's only organizations. With the new e-library that we're building, people will be. Mm. aware now and they'll be able to use our data uh, because I've, I've gone to your website hoping to get the, the data but i didn't quite see it and it was a downer for me i mean mm. it's our figures right mm. <laughs> <laughs> in country. Uh, but i but, promise things are changing okay and we'll mm. keep tabs uh, so true. many areas to cover but I we've know. tried to scratch the surface yes. hopefully in the coming days we'll talk more about this but we'd like to thank you so much uh, for thank your you time and much. insight mrs bimbala salu hondain who's honorable federal commissioner national population commission thank she was you. acting chairman of the mpc 2019 to 2020. She's been speaking with us from our Lagos studio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, happy Easter. Same to you. Thank you. So let's go on a break now. And when we return, we'll talk about an issue we have raised, which is elections. That's in a moment. Stay with us. Mr. Festus Okoye joins us this morning. He is National Commissioner INEC and Chairman Information and Voter Education of the Commission. He joins us from our studio in Abuja. Thanks for joining us this morning, Mr. Okoye, and compliments of Easter to you. Yeah, same to you. Okay. Well, it definitely is uh, very concerning times for, for INEC, given all of the information that is coming around back and forth. Um, and we also understand that there's been some update about the attack uh, in Imo. Uh, so far, so good. We, we, unfortunate the death of uh, Mr. Anthony and the reconnection with some of your staff that had hitherto not been seen. Can you, what further information can you give us now about that attack? Well, uh, we don't have any uh, further updates other than the update uh, we um, um, issued on the uh, 15th day of, um, of, of April. Um, as, as we are already aware, on the uh, 14th day of April, uh, some of our staff uh, who we are on national assignment doing the continuous voters registration exercise um, in, um, in Amako here, uh, Amako here ward, in um, Ihitu Boma, a local government area, we are attacked. And in the process, one of them lost his life by name Mwokuria Anthony. Uh, and thereafter, he was evacuated to the morgue uh, with the assistance of the uh, security agencies and the chairman of the local government. And then um, on, that, uh, uh, on that fourth thing, uh, two, of, two additional staff of the commission who were with him uh, were nowhere to be seen. Uh, but by Friday, we had uh, made contact with them. We had located them. Uh, they had minor inju inju injuries, and the injuries were not life-threatening. And the resident electoral commissioner for Imo State uh, promised to um, do everything possible to make sure uh, that they rejoin their families. Uh, so that's the only update we have uh, as, as of today. And then uh, thereafter, the same uh, on the 
15th, uh, we had the further threats uh, to our staff uh, in a human bar, not local government area of, um, of the same Imo state. Uh, so based on that, uh, the resident electoral commissioner uh, made further report to the commission, and the commission decided uh, that it was important uh, to suspend uh, further uh, uh, CVR in four of the local government um, uh, areas of um, uh, of, of Imo State, uh, prior to this particular, uh, in three of the local governments, uh, prior to this particular period, uh, the Commission has suspended um, um, CVR in Osu local government, in Njaba local government, and then also suspended in a human banner. Now, based on the threats, we decided that all the CVR will now be done at the state and local government offices of the Commission uh, in, the entire, uh, in the entire state. Uh, so, as of today, we're only doing CVR in the state and local government uh, offices of the Commission in all the local government areas of Imo State, except the three local governments I've mentioned, where we suspended the CVR indefinitely. And these are also uh, local government, Njaba local government, and Ihitu Boma local government. Uh, given the information that came with that viral video of that unfortunate occurrence, uh, the message, the, the, the commentaries that were on it and the message that's uh, supposed to have connoted. How is INET taking that message on board? Well, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the commission, our remit is to make sure uh, that we capture all the persons who are ready uh, to register as, as voters. That's our remit and that's our mandate. Now, based on the security challenges we encountered in uh, Ihitu Boma local government, uh, the security agencies have taken over from, 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 where, from where we stopped. Uh, so um, immediately after this Easter holiday, we expect to get further updates uh, from the security agencies on what they know, what they have uncovered, and the level and extent of, extent of their investigation. Uh, so as far as the commission is concerned, we are not going to speculate. We are not going to make any, any deductions uh, relating to the issues, uh, since we do not have uh, the power of investigation, the security agencies will definitely unravel the circumstances leading to this particular issue and maybe the motives of those who carried out um, uh, the attack. And then that will assist the Commission in formulating its policies uh, going forward, especially in relation to the uh, three local governments where we suspended uh, the CVR indefinitely. And, you know, this resurgence, in quotes, is really worrying because, uh, I mean, we, we used to have attacks, yes, on INEC offices last year and the previous year, and they stopped, essentially. I think it was around May last year, and these attacks stopped. Yes, we used to see a series of attacks on INEC installations and offices staff at that time, but it seemed as though those attacks stopped. Now we have these uh, resurgence, which we're hoping is just a one-off. But I'd like you to walk us through at least that period. What did INEC and perhaps the security agencies get right uh, such that those attacks stopped? Well, uh, um, as, as you pointed out, uh, we really want to believe that uh, this uh, present attack is, is a, a one-off one thing and that it will not continue. If, if you recall, this particular commission uh, started the CVR on the 28th day of, um, of June uh, 2021. And on that 28th day of June 2021, we decided to do only online pre-registration based on our interaction with the various security agencies or under the auspices of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. And also based on our interaction with uh, the political parties, civil society groups and organizations and the media who jointly agreed that we should not roll out in all the states of the, um, in all the uh, 8,809 registration areas, but that we should roll out gradually. And it was on the basis of that that we rolled out uh, to, the, uh, to the state and local government offices of the commission. It was on further review of the security situation uh, throughout the federation and the need to take registration closer to the people that we decided uh, to roll out to the various registration areas on a, re on a rotational basis. And that was what led uh, to this particular incident because we were doing uh, the CVR in the registration areas on a rotational basis. Yeah, especially in Imo State, we have 54 centers uh, where we were doing this uh, CVR on a rotational basis. Now, relating to the previous attacks, 
we had dialogue, uh, we had consultation uh, with the various security agencies, and we were also given uh, uh, tips on how to safeguard uh, some of our installations, how to safeguard uh, some of our critical and essential materials in, in, the st in the state and local government offices. And we carried out some of the instructions of the security agencies and the security agencies on their own uh, also designed their own measures on how to safeguard our facilities. And then the various, in, in, even in some of the uh, local governments, in some of the states, the communities where these attacks uh, took place decided on their own to assist the commission in rebuilding uh, some of the facilities. Now, in relation to uh, the attacks in, in Imo State, we had agreed with the various communities because there was a community engagement, there was a stakeholder engagement relating to our deployment. And the critical stakeholders in most of the local governments uh, promised that they were going to assist the commission, uh, protect the staff and equipment that we were, we were going to deploy. It was on the basis of that that we did this uh, uh, deployment. But apparently something went wrong somewhere and uh, the security agencies will definitely get to the root of what went wrong. And, you know, this is on the back of uh, the statement made by... Uh, uh, INEX National Commissioner Professor Okechukwu Banu, who expressed uh, surprise that no culprits had been apprehended in all the attacks. That's the ones we saw last year and the previous year. And he says, makes it difficult to know exactly those responsible and the motive. At that time, it was arson we were seeing across your offices. And I'd like to ask, between then and now, perhaps, have you seen any traction in terms of arrests, prosecution, at least I'm sure the security agencies will be keeping INEC updated on those. Well, our, our expectation is that um, immediately after this uh, Easter, Easter break, uh, that there will be a meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security, where some of these issues will be tabled afresh, uh, where the, the, this uh, present threat will also be tabled, and then we are going to receive briefing and update uh, from the various security agencies on what they have done in relation to previous attacks and what they have done in relation uh, to this uh, present resurgence. And then uh, we will take it from there. But as, as of today, I don't have information relating to uh, the, the, the number of persons arrested and the number of prosecutions uh, that have been carried out. I don't have any update on that. But I believe that uh, immediately after this uh, Easter holiday, uh, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, who chairs the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security, together with the National Security Advisor, uh, who is the co-chair, will convene a meeting and then we will uh, deliberate on all these issues and then design new measures and new mechanisms of how to uh, uh, contain some of these uh, challenges. You know, I, I'll be shocked, really, if no arrest or at least prosecution has been done. This is over a year since we've seen those attacks, and of course for this fresh one. But one can only imagine the pain and agony being felt by the family of late Mr. Wukore Anthony, who was killed uh, that day. I, I just want to know, what kind of soccer is INEC providing for the family, who, who must be going through a lot at this time? Well, uh, you know, we, we insure all our staff. Uh, we carry out comprehensive insurance on all our staff who are engaged in national assignment. Uh, we also have a welfare package for all our staff uh, who are out there uh, in the field. But, you know, there is no form of insurance cover and no form of compensation that can make up for a single human life. Uh, so, um, and, and that was why we made it very, very clear that we are not going to put any of our staff in harm's way. And that was the same reason why the commission did not roll out on time uh, in all the local government areas and in all the uh, registration areas. Uh, and what we decided was that we are going to be rolling out on a rollout and rollback basis. If we roll out and we encounter very, very serious challenges, we will roll back to our local government and state offices. And as you also know, there are so many states of the Federation, where we have what we call frontline local governments, where we have uh, challenges of insurgency, where we have challenges of banditry, where we have serious cases of kidnapping. We, have, we are not doing CVR in some of these, um, these frontline local governments uh, because we cannot sacrifice the, the, the security of, of, of any of our staff on the basis of, um, of, of CVR. Uh, so there's no form of compensation that will 
compensate for a single human life. And only God kn knows what um, the families are going through at this particular moment. And this is a young man that has been caught down in the prime of his life. And um, our heart goes out to the family. And uh, we only pray that God will give them the fortitude to bear uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this loss. You know, it's unfortunate uh, that we have to be talking about someone so full of life in the past tense at a time like this. But then the implications of such a sacrifice is what you are also talking about here now, Mr. Okori, which is the fact that if these issues, these attacks, these uh, unfortunate incidences continue, as you said, and it will roll back, what are the implications of that? Should there be a sizable number of uh, centers in the country where INEC rolls back and consequently, people are unable to vote. There are those who are going to question the authenticity of the election in 2023. Well, uh, if you recall, and let me further emphasize, we agree completely that a credible voter's rule, an authentic voter's rule, is the foundation of the electoral process. There's no doubt about that. Now, we already have over 84 million uh, Nigerians on our voters' rule. These ones, we are not registering them afresh. What we are doing is what we call continuous voters' registration exercise. One, to capture those who have not been captured since the last registration exercise. Secondly, to capture those who have attained the age of 18 uh, uh, since the la uh, last registration exercise. To also make sure that those who have lost their PVCs or whose PVCs have been defaced get a replacement. And also to make sure that those who have moved from one place to the other uh, 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 get a replacement so that they will be in a position to vote in their new location. So this is a continuous voters registration exercise. I completely agree that there will be a problem, there's a challenge if a sizable number of our people are unable to register. But one thing you must realize is that this continuous voters registration exercise did not start today. We have been on this for the past nine months, for nine months. So we are now on the last quarter of the, of the, of the CVR, which will terminate on the 30th day of June, uh, 2022. And so, but we are confident uh, that we are going to register all Nigerians who are interested in registering. But there is a possibility that some Nigerians uh, may, through no fault of theirs, uh, through the type of ch uh, security challenges we have in the country as of today, uh, not be in a position uh, uh, to, to, to get registered. And I think it will be unfortunate. But we are going to make all efforts uh, to make sure that we capture and register every registrable Nigerian who is interested in registering. In some of these local governments that we have suspended registration, there's a possibility that, if the, sec that the security situation may improve and we will roll out uh, to those local governments once again. But in these three local governments I have mentioned, the CVR is suspended indefinitely. Uh, but we keep on assessing and reassessing the security situation in all the states of the Federation. And I believe that when we hold this uh, quarterly meeting with uh, the, the security agencies, the political parties, civil society groups and organizations and the media, we will further review the situation in different parts of the country. And also, we also receive briefing from our resident electoral commissioners on how we are dealing with the CVR and the type of security issues um, uh, that we have in their various states. The, the challenge will transit, could transit from voter registration to voting. Uh, and, you know, it will seem like it's all encompassing a buffet of activities, so to speak, that people have to go through. So, uh, and I know, just as you've said, there's going to be some briefing about the security situation and the safety and security of not just INEC officials, but the people who will come out to vote. If these uh, elements are able to instill enough fear in people, voter apathy will only get worse. And there are those who are wondering, with the level of voter apathy that we've had over the years, and or should I even say incremental voter apathy, uh, gradual reduction in the number of voters, percentage of people that come out to vote from the 84 million that you talked about. And so one is wondering, how do we instill voter confidence in the 2023 elections? There are still about two elections or there are about before the general elections of next year. So what is the plan 
to instill voter confidence in the process to ensure their safety. I know INEC is not a security agency. You have to collaborate and all of that. But what assurances can INEC give that people who come out to vote, who take part in this process, will be safe and secure? Well, I, I, I really believe that um, the issue of security should be the collective business of all Nigerians. All of us have the responsibility uh, to make sure that we assist the security agencies to degrade as much as possible the current security uh, challenges um, in, different parts of, in different parts of the country. Nigerians are entitled as a people and as a nation uh, to go out and exercise their democratic franchise. They are entitled to go and make that choice, and they can only make that choice if they, go, they are confident that they can go out to the pulling units without being molested, that they can go out to the pulling units without losing their lives and without being maimed. They have to have a reason, reasonable measure of confidence uh, that what they are doing will not lose to any loss of life. That is uh, uh, their, their own expectation. The commission also expects that when we deploy over a million five hundred ad hoc staff, that nothing untoward will be for them, that they will be safe, and that our materials and equipment will be safe. And so I, I, I believe that the various, various security agencies understand the enormity of the challenges um, uh, uh, at stake. They should also understand that on that section, uh, 132 subsection 2 and under one, uh, section 178 subsection 2 of the constitution that we have a, a window within which we must conduct uh, the 2023 elections and that that particular window when it closes the only other issue you have is a constitutional challenge, it's a constitutional logjam and, and nobody wants this country to go into, into a constitutional logjam. So I, I, I'm, I'm confident uh, that with the cooperation of all Nigerians and with the insistence of the security agencies uh, to do the right thing, that they are going to make sure that we degrade these security challenges in most parts of the country to enable Nigerians have the confidence that they can come out on election day uh, to come and vote. And so, as I pointed out, some of these issues will be tabled before the Interagency Consultative uh, Committee on Election Security. And so Just... that the efforts will begin in earnest to make sure that we have uh, some level of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 some level of peace and some right. level of conducive environment in all states of the federation. That okay, just a quick one. Uh, uh, peaceful election and also inclusive election. Uh, just a quick one, Mr. Okoye. I recall last year, September, uh, the INEC chairman asked the National Population Commission to assist in cleaning up uh, the voter register. And, you know, at that time, the population census was built for this year, May 2022. But now it has been moved to next year after the election. Uh, just I wonder, uh, how is INEC taking that on board? I imagine that would affect that whole process of cleaning up the voter register with the help of the MPC. Well, uh, what the INEC chairman said was that we will continue to cooperate uh, with all the agencies of government that store or retrieve one form of data or the other, or that are constitutionally and legally uh, permitted to assess the data of Nigerians. And you know uh, that the commission does not keep the register of births and deaths. And one of the biggest challenges we have in this country is that when we carry out voters' registration, or what, when we carry out continuous voters' registration exercise, we do what we call display of the voters' register for claims and objections. And the import is for Nigerians to look at some of the, uh, uh, to look at the register, assist the commission detect those who have passed on, assist the commission detect those who are not supposed to be on the voters' register, assist the commission detect those who have sneaked into the voters' register, uh, maybe as underage, um, as the underage registrants. And then that will help us clean up the, 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 the voters' register and make it more compact, make it more credible. And then if we cannot get an accurate register of deaths and bets, there's no way we can be in a position to remove uh, those who are dead, except when very prominent Nigerians die, and then you can confidently remove their names from the register. But removing somebody's name from the register is a very, very cumbersome process. It's a very tedious process, and uh, you don't want to go and remove somebody's name from the register who, is, uh, who, is, who, who, who has not passed on. 
Uh, so we will continue to collaborate with them um, and uh, cooperate with them in terms of assessing their data to enable us to uh, clean up the voters' register. The same thing with the immigration department who uh, sometimes arrest uh, foreigners who are not supposed to register and who are in possession of a um, voter's card. So when okay. they do that, we use the, the, the information to clean up the voters' register. But we have a more robust system now that can be used to clean up the voters' register. Okay. Well, we can only hope and uh, aspire that at least INEC will, give, will, be get, will get all the support that the Commission needs to do a good job for us in the lead-up to the 2023 general elections and beyond. Mr. Festo Sokoye, National Commissioner, as well as Chairman, Information and Voter Education of INEC, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, and I wish you a happy Easter once again. Wish you the same. It's still politics um, right after now. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily this Easter Monday. Well, let's talk politics. After all, it's quarter to 2023, as they say. On this day last week, the number two man, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, declared his intention to run for the number one seat in the country exactly this day last week. But ever since that declaration, there's been lots of reaction, twists and turns here and there, emergence of others, lots of permutation and calculations. And that's what we're taking a look at this morning uh, with the gentleman which you saw in that opening slide. We're joined by Mr. Femi Atoyebi, who is a senior advocate of Nigeria, joins us uh, via Zoom this morning. And in our Abuja studio, Honorable Kayode Oladele, who is a former member House of Representatives. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the program and uh, happy Easter uh, to both of you. I'll begin with Mr. Toebi, who joins us via Zoom this morning. Uh, ever since the Vice President's declaration, there's been different reactions, really, and that will indicate that this would be a grueling contest in the build up uh, to 2023. So, uh, what would you say still of the Vice President's chances in the light of, of the reactions, the emergence? and other aspirants in the run. Thank you so much for having me, um, and happy Easter to you as well. Uh, as far as the chances of the vice president um, to clinch the party's nomination is concerned, I believe that Nigerians should be looking, that includes the delegates, should be looking at the CV, and I'm not talking of just academic CV, but the totality of the man who is vying for this uh, exalted office. The last seven years, no doubt, has shown Nigerians what Professor Yemi Oshimaju, SEN, is capable of doing. Prior to that time, also, people have seen in every public office he's been privileged to occupy what he had done. And so I think in terms of all those who have come forward thus far to indicate their interest in that office, he stands shoulders, heads above shoulders, all of them, in my candid and humble opinion. So I, I think his chances are quite bright if he gets the party's nomination. Okay, uh, let me take Honorable Oladili's opening comments as well. Then we'll come to the nitty gritties as it were. So uh, Honorable Oladili, uh, seeing the, you know, the different angles to this, the other people in the running, uh, I mean, uh, one of the dailies did a breakdown of the delegates and, you know, the regions they're from. And um, all of the reactions that have followed the vice president's declaration. Uh, do you see this as a very challenging uh, build up or easy peasy for the vice president? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see it as a very challenging uh, contest for him at all, particularly uh, when you talk about the reactions, the reactions are normal. Uh, it's not unusual politically to have people reacting to this type of thing. Uh, 
The only thing that all, all people don't understand is, the, is that what we have in the country today, particularly uh, the contestants that are coming out, is within, they are within the same political party. So when you are talking about the issue of contestants saying that one is a betrayer, one is a traitor, it doesn't happen because we are talking about one single family. We have individuals contesting for different positions. And uh, it's not new politically. For those who are saying that, it's only a way of distracting, distracting attentions from the main thing. Uh, we have very, very important things to discuss that we should put on the table. And I, I will tell you, uh, if you look at uh, other advanced countries like the US, uh, you see that the issue of name calling, particularly when we are talking about the same party, people running under the same party, is not unusual. But at the end of the day, they will close ranks to work for the um, uh, interest of the party as soon as uh, a candidate emerges. So it's not unusual. Well, let me speak with, speak with you, stick with you, Honorable. Given the way uh, we yes. run politics, uh, you know, in our country for now, especially from your experience in the Fourth Republic so far, uh, the way politics is being played, there are those who are saying, okay, because you re really at this stage, uh, you talked about the issues that need to be raised, but at this stage the issues don't seem to play much of a significant role in the considerations and permutations. It's, first of all, the politics of it. And there are those who are wondering if the vice president has enough political experience, so to speak, considering his background more as a technocrat. Honorable, can you hear me? I can barely hear the last part of the question. Please, can you just... Okay. The question I'm asking is that generally, in the build-up to the elections, especially at the stage where we are now, yes. where primaries is being con considered, there are those who are wondering, the issues are far less of what the issues to be discussed, to be, to be raised, to be dealt with are, but more of the politics of it. And there are those who are wondering if the vice president has enough political experience, given his background uh, as a technocrat, more of that than that of a politician. How would you respond to that? Well, I, I think people are getting it wrong, and it is high time we addressed the main issue and also uh, change the narratives. For instance, you are talking about uh, the area where uh, we are talking about the politics of it. Even as I said earlier on, uh, talking about the politics of it, we have a situation where a, somebody who has been pr president for the, vice president for about seven years now, by May to be seven years that he's been president, the vice president of the country. And if you, con if you look at his opening declaration when he declared, he said he's traveled all over the country, he has the wherewithal, he has the experience as the vice president, he has the practical experience. Before that, whoever, I mean, he was, he was, he was uh, commissioner for justice, attorney general of Lagos State. He served as special advisor to the attorney general of Nigeria in between 1988 and 1992. He was in the uh, World Court, he was in the United Nations. So he has so much experience to talk about. And somebody, for goodness sake, who has been vice president for eight years, working with this president, moving around, going to all the uh, communities, working with peasant, with labor, with the uh, captains of industry, he has seen it all. And he knows where the shoe pinches. Now, let us talk about the brass task. We are talking about people who feel that he has done something wrong for declaring to run for the, for the election. As, as I said, we need to change that narrative. And this, this is the reason. For instance, in the US, Mr. B. Richardson, who was the 30th governor of New Mexico, he was appointed by uh, Bill Clinton as the UN, Nigeria, US, sorry, US uh, ambassador to U UN. After that, he became the secretary, energy secretary to Clinton. After that, it was the same Clinton that assisted him to become the governor of New Mexico. First term, second term. And of, course, and of course, after that, he became the chairman of National Democratic Convention. And when Bill Clinton was running, when Hillary Clinton was running for presidency against uh, uh, Obama, he also ran in the first round. And when he lost out, 
he gave his delegates to Obama. Despite the fact that the Clintons went with him, they felt that they were the ones that assisted him, they appointed him as energy secretary, they appointed him as the U.S. ambassador to UN. But he said, look, this is not a question of personal interaction. It's not a question of morality. It's a question of national interest. And nobody, nobody said anything. Because what we are looking for, for goodness sake, is the national interest. So since that time up to this moment, the Clintons still regard B. Richardson as their friend. They don't see him as a sellout. So uh, what I'm saying in essence is that all this idea, all these issues of somebody betraying, somebody doing, they, we, we, we have to limit it within the concept of, the, within the com, com, uh, concept of political name calling. And of course, we should avoid a situation where we hit below the belt. Mm. We should avoid a situation where all these name callings, they take away from the, from the table the main things that affect this country. As, I, as you will have seen, we have the issue of security challenges, we have the issue of the economy, we have the issue of the infrastructure. These are the things the Vice President is looking at. So if anybody says that because uh, if somebody who has been Vice President for seven years now does not have political experience to run, I think we are begging the issue. And of course, to me, it's fallacious. It's not something anybody should give any serious consideration to. Uh, politics can come, but I think we have to be realistic. We have to look at the interests of the country. We have to look at what is good for us. A lot of people called, millions of Nigerians called for the vice president to run. They know that he has what it takes. They know that he's somebody that has the erudition, the power, the understanding of the country. He, he understands what it means to be the president, having been vice president for these seven years. So I don't think and I don't agree with the fact that as it is, it is a tech, it's no longer a technocrat. Even anything at all is a combination of technocracy and politics. Okay. Well, Mr. Toebi, uh, you, you closed the, your opening comments earlier by saying if he gets the ticket, the primaries, the tickets of the APC at the primaries. So the question that I want to put to you, sir, is what are the political hurdles that you think uh, needs to be considered in this build-up? At this stage, um, you generally, many people don't, haven't seen, historically, haven't seen politicians at this stage before getting to the uh, becoming candidates for their party uh, and a lot of issues discussed. So what plays, a, uh, unfortunately, plays a lot of roles this time? Uh, the name callings, the betrayals, just as uh, Honorable Aladdin mentioned, the mudslinging and all of those things. <laughs> yeah, that's not something that most technocrats will want to do. So what are the issues that you see that the, pre the vice president would need to contend with and are there solutions you can proffer? Thank you so much. Uh, let me first comment um, on Honorable Oladele's last answer to your question, the last question to him. And I'm supporting him. Um, but I'd like to add by giving us an analogy as to whether Professor Shimbaju SN is experienced enough has political experience enough to steer this nation come 2023. Honestly speaking, I'm not sure why this question is making so much uh, uh, issues, raising so much dust. As far as I can see, since independence, I'm not aware of any other vice president who has traversed the length and breadth of this nation trying to have a feel of the people. In so doing, he's gathered so much experience politically. He's in virtually every state. It doesn't matter what party they belonged to. Now, he's also, as the Honorable has argued, he's also acted as vice president. He's been vice president for seven years, approximately. And very importantly, he's acted as president in the absence of the president of the Federal Republic when he was away. 
for quite a number of weeks. And Nigerians can attest to the, to the uh, uh, capacity that he, he demonstrated, the competence, the skills that he demonstrated. Now, contrast that with any other candidate. None of them, none of them has anywhere near experience as he has today. And that is not just alone, but if you look at the other non-political experiences is, is garnered in over the years when he served at the United Nations, when he served as the special advisor to the uh, Honorable Attorney General, George Bola Ajibola, at, I think, the age of 31, when he became a, a professor of law at 36, a law lecturer at 23. All those will count for something when you when you put them together with his experience in the presidency since he has been privileged to serve along with Mr. President. So, so far as that goes. And I will, and I, and I will give you this analogy, if I may. Here we have, let's say, two candidates, whoever the other candidate might be. Let's say they are pilots. One has been a pilot on a small jetliner and has had about 50 years of flying, ex 50 hours, pardon me, of flying experience. And then we have vice president, who obviously is flying a jumbo jet and is putting about a thousand hours. How can we possibly compare the experience politically of those two? If you are a governor or a senator, a combination of both, I would still liken you to the pilot who is on the small jetliner with few hours. Governing a state is completely different from governing a nation like Nigeria. And so, in terms of experience, I would say nobody else has anywhere near as much experience in that office as does the vice president. And of course, your question, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, what it has to do, I think Nigeria has moved on from the politics of the past as we used to know them. Politics of the past will dwell on personality rather than issues. And people have seen through that. It's a way that politicians used to kind of deceive the populace, the electorate. But today, people are looking at issues. And I believe sincerely, every right-thinking Nigerian should be more issues-focused than personality. Not that, not that the professor, uh, vice president, had any personal issues. Certainly not. All they say is that he is betraying uh, um, um, ex-Governor Tinubu. But, but let's, let's face it. I have never heard ex-Governor Tinubu make such an allegation. It's some people, what I call busybodies, who go about putting uh, uh, posters all over the place to say that someone is Judas Iscariot, someone is Jesus, and all of that. But the truth is, Tinubu never said that to anyone. Because he knew Same. that there's no such thing as betrayal between him okay. and the vice president. So, Mr. Toibi, in essence, you're saying essentially uh, that the former governor of Lagos State is okay with the vice president declaring his intention and running for president. I, I cannot hold brief for him. He may or may not be okay. But the truth is that doesn't make Professor Oshimaju a, bet uh, 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 a betrayer. He doesn't. I don't know whether he's okay with it, but come to think of it, sir. Before Professor Shimbaju declared his intention to run for the exalted office of the, of the president, three or four other people have declared their intentions to do so. Heavens did not fall. And I, and I just think that someone is, is really, really concerned because of his sterling qualities, 
Well, the tricky part capacity to, to do the work. Uh, the tricky part is those other people didn't have the kind of relationship that they had. But you know what? Let's still stick to the issues. And you know, speaking of running, we have to run in about three minutes on the program. So I'll see how much questions we can raise in that in that short time. As vice president, I mean, aside traveling to practically all the local governments which you talked about, aside standing in for the president, what are the major achievements you say the vice president now aspirant? Yamiya Shimajo has to his name. All right. Now, if you, Sebra, are you asking in terms of in government or out of government, if it is his light-time achievement, you have to begin from the no, no. classrooms. So, so what I said is, Mr. Me. Toyobi, pardon me. So what I said was Vice President Yamiya Shimajo, now aspirant. Okay. So his achievement in office. Great. Now... First of all, you have to understand that under the Constitution, he is supposed to be supporting Mr. President. In America, they have the saying that the Vice President is supposed to be seen and not heard. We, are, you, we operate a constitutional, a presidential uh, um, system in Nigeria as well. Now, everything the Mr. President has given him to do, I want to say he has performed creditably well. Don't forget that whatever he does, he will still have to report back to Mr. President, who we all voted in office. And so I believe the fact that he's been able to sell a lot of the positive uh, uh, um, policies of this government, a lot of the infrastructures that this current government is being executed and continues to execute, he's been running up and down the whole place to get this done. He has brought bright ideas to this government. Of course, you are not going to know that. I'm not going to know that because that is an internal thing. Well, Whatever is done, is done B as the presidency. You, you sound as though you are even sure. Yes, you can say I don't know it, but you sound as though you know it yourself. But let's take this to uh, Honorable Oladele as we wind down. So, well, for Mr. Toyebi, the infrastructure development and all of that, yes, the vice president was sort of a part of it. But can we divorce the vice president from what a lot of people have termed the failure of this government in terms of insecurity. I mean, the president, this, uh, this government promised to crush Boko Haram in three months. Now, the Minister of Information is saying even the terrorists are in connivance with the bandits. So essentially, there's still a lot of work going on there. So can we divorce the vice president from the failures of this government? Well, uh, I don't know what you mean by failure of the government. We have challenges, you know, uh, every government has its own challenges. Before uh, we got into, before it, the 2015 uh, administration of the, uh, Buhari, we had uh, Gula Jonathan there. And of course, we had some challenges at the time. So since that time to this time, a lot of things have changed. You don't expect the, pres the vice president to say that, well, I want to divorce myself from my boss because certain areas are failures, certain areas are successes. Of course, as a vice president, just like Mr. Tebu Riley said, he has to follow whatever thing the president has done. And he has to also uh, take the achievements. If there's any failure, if there's any, which is, of course, uh, uh, I can tell you it's not something that anybody can say a failure of government. We can have challenges, challenges. No government can do everything. So for him, he, if you look at this, the opening declaration, the opening statement, he gave a very glowing expression to the president. He said he has done so well because we have worked together for the past seven years. This is what we have done. And at the same time, we appreciate the fact that we, they still have challenges. And these are the challenges we, he has also uh, personally acknowledged. Of course, that is why when we give him the second term, he will be able to, he'll be able to correct those areas that we see as challenges. But again, it's going to take all the areas of successes of this administration within when it's campaigning because well, the main thing focus is going to be on continuity and if you are okay. talking about continuity you have to talk about your successes and of course your challenges so well, he's going to look at the infrastructure he's going to look at the economy he's going to look at the, the, the security we right. have successes in all of these areas and of course if there's any challenges you will be ready and willing to be able to make amends and make corrections in the, okay. when he becomes the president 
Well, Honorable, we're yes. running as well, but we are running for time. But we'll have to thank you so much, uh, Honorable Kayode uh, Oladile, who's a former member of the House of Representatives, joining us from our Abuja studio, as well as Mr. Femi Atoyebi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on the program this Easter Monday morning. We appreciate your time sincerely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, that's finally, that's our, our guests are on uh, putting in their own five cents, as we say, on the program this morning. <laughs> Nath, and I like, uh, you may want to consider Nath's comment on uh, the program today on the proposed national census. One way to check migration during census is probably to declare a compulsory national lockdown for the entire duration of census count. Seven days. Okay. That's him. Uh, let's take one more series of messages, I should say. But this next one is from Festus Akimboyewa saying, while national census is vital to government for developing policies, running public services, and allocating funding, it's expensive and no guarantee that it will be accurate and efficient. If we're having a 21st census or 21st century census, I imagine governments must find ways of doing better, quicker, and cheaper. Hola, Dele, hola, Guju, and Pastor Lo Alpha, we got your messages as well. Thank you for your comments. That's the show this morning. Have a wonderful holiday for those who are on holiday and rest for those who can. I'm Ayo Makini. Uh, I'm Kaya Okikulu. Maybe I should grab some picnic later today. Have a fantastic holiday.